I was, when I began to study this book, uh, I had never really sat down and studied it. Um, but uh, when I began to study it, I, I was just asking those same questions, you know, the uh, who, what, when, why, those kinds of questions. And so, and so the title of this study that I began to just start writing was that um, uh, the, sincerely we share and sincerely we search for truth. Um, meaning that the, the folks that are sharing the, the gospel here at the bridge, um, as we go into the study, you'll kind of understand where I'm getting this from. Uh, they do their utmost I would use the word diligence to really pull out the truth in God's word. Um, and they don't mix it with anything else. Um, and I've, I've, I've always said that you can find a lot of comfort if you have never been to the bridge before, but a lot of you guys have been here before that you know that the word is always going to be the word of God. And and if, you're, if you ever find yourself in a position to be teaching or leading a Bible study, always remember that, that the guys who have come before you, that's the standard that they have set. Um, anything less than that, <laughs> they'll be able to tell. <laughs> you know I me, mean? the guys that are here will be like, that ain't right. Wait a minute. Time out for a minute, you know. And they'll let you know. But not in a way that... Um, uh, that's putting any pressure on you, but just that to make sure that, you know, that the discussion that we're having is clear and there's no confusion. And so that's what I meant by sincerely we share and that we sincerely we search for truth. And if there's a question in the scripture, then we always turn to the scripture to try to find out what that answer is. Um, and of course, you know, there's always some literature that you can read. A lot of guys read a lot of things outside of the Bible to try to, um, I guess, get a 360 perspective on um, other people and their views. Um, not that you uh, make that a doctrine, but at least you want to know what's out there. Um, and again, I, I guess that reminds me to when you do that to make sure that you are guarding your heart, when you read those things, those different sorts of literatures, and um, always question those things against the scripture. You know, always when I'm reading something, you know, especially if it has some sort of scriptural reference or if I'm reading it and the Holy Spirit kind of leads me into thinking of some sort of passage, you know, I automatically write that down or try to turn to that passage to really try to compare, you know, does the Bible say that or, does, or are you just, you know, paraphrasing some sort of part of the Bible and it, you're not really keeping it within the context. Um, so, and so the, uh, the next slide, it goes that way, yeah. So it will be 2 Corinthians 2 and 17. I, again, I got like 30 slides, man. I don't even know where I'm going with this. So, but definitely going to be in the, um, the book of Jude. Matter of fact, did I bring my, I got to get my Bible out, don't I? Did I pray already? Yes. I took on this new position at my job, man, so I'm kind of all over the place right now. Excuse me for that. I've been delving back in the payroll area. Crazy, man. And, of course, Friday is payday, so it was like last minute today. So, gladly, we got uh, balanced before I left. So, that's a good thing. So, so, for we are not many, as many, which corrupt, well, that's the next one, unlike so many, I, speaking of myself, do not peddle the word of God for profit, which the Bible says, or gain. On the, on the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those that are sent from God. And this is the uh, NIV version, is what I'm alluding to as far as the uh, title goes. And in, in the King James Version, just for my man Steve Kyle here, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, 
but sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak, uh, speak we in Christ. Um, and I like the King James Version because it's, you know, I grew up with the King James Version. Um, my favorite Bible, my grandfather, was the King James Version. I read that, and so I get uh, uplifted when I read that. So, the book of Jude. Let's go ahead and go through these 25. You're already there. Say amen. All right. And so, we'll go through the book of Jude. So it says, Jude, a bondservant of James, I'm sorry, bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. I'm in a new King James Version now. Which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, un condemnation and ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, that's the bottom line right there. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the visions of eternal fire. In verse 8, likewise, all these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael, the archangel, is con in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reveling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not, they do not know. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts in these things, they corrupt themselves. So woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. And in verse 12, these are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame and wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to, conv to convict all who are ungodly among them for all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are the grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who will walk according to their own ungodly lusts, these are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. But you, beloved, verse 20, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of your Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. And then, of course, the famous, now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to resent you faultless before the presence 
of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So Jude, man, goes into a lot, you know. Um, um, one of the things that I found to be interesting was that, you know, there's only one book in the Bible that doesn't talk about these end times or this apostasy or this great falling away. It's just, and that's the book of Philemon. You mentioned it earlier. You know, um, most of the New Testament it talks about this falling away. So who was Judah? Uh, Jude being, of course, uh, we know that Jude is the brother of, Messiah, of Jesus. Jesus. I like using the word Messiah. Uh, he's a brother of James. And James, of course, was stoned to death in Jerusalem, early 60 AD. And the reason why I mention that because this book of Jude uh, supposedly was written around, around 60 to 80 AD. Um, and so I thought that was um, pretty significant. Um, and of course, that was uh, Jude's brother. And so, and he was also the brother of Christ. But somewhere I read that Jude didn't seem to be enthusiastic about being the brother of these two. Uh, I, can't, I couldn't find where I had read that. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, he is uh, part of the canon, and his epistle is uh, very important uh, uh, back then and now. Uh, it's very important. And of course, the, the fall of Jerusalem was around 70 AD, so about um, 10 years before Jude wrote this book. All right. So what was Jude's purpose? To me, um, of course, Jude alludes to um, he first came to write about salvation. He said, I wanted to come to talk to you about salvation, um, about your saving grace, um, how it save you from suffering, that sort of thing. But I've changed my mind. I come to tell you about these false teachers. Um, yet, when you think of it, or when I think of it, you know, he may have came to talk about God's saving grace and, and suffering, but yet he talks about uh, these false teachers, and still he's still trying to save you. He's still trying to help you um, understand exactly what you're up against. Um, it's almost as if, you know, the Egyptian army is barreling down on you, um, and you're off doing something and you don't even realize they're coming. Because he uses the word unawares, they crept in. Um, and so and I think Steve, again, he talks about this uh, uh, this uh, allowing, this, this tolerance that we allow. Um, and I think sometimes, man, as I'm reading this book, I was reading this book, I thought about, you know, okay, well, what is this crept in thing? You know, what is this all about? And it's not that you don't know. You know it's not, you know, you, know, you, you, hear, you read the words crept in unawares, and I'm thinking, how in the world did you get in here and then nobody see you? You know, that's kind of hard to do, you know. We, you know, you, you're just going to come and kick down the door, and you're just going to start spreading heresies around here. Ain't nobody going to notice, you know? Is that, is that how that's going to happen? No, nah, that's not how it's going to happen. And, and the reason why I say that he's warning us, again, he's, he's telling you, if you read it and study it yourself, you would probably get the same thing. He's warning you because, you know, they're already here. You know, the enemy is already inside the door. You know, he's, he's sitting, he, he says, and he's sitting right next to you. He's a spot. He's right there. You, you, you can't miss him. You know, but, and also says you have to be careful to listen. You have to be careful to listen to what they're actually saying. Okay, so, so Jude is warning about us, warning us about these so-called on the way we're living. Um, so Jude focuses on less on what these people were teaching than on the way they were living. Right, And so at the heart of Jews' critique is the charge that they were libertines. It's, and you see this word libertines again in Acts 6, um, where you have them uh, battling it out with Stephen. Uh, we, have, we have a scripture here in Acts 6. Uh, they assumed that God's grace revealed in Christ gave them the freedom to do whatever they pleased. And so it also in Jews talks about how they were living in how they were ungodly and this uh, lustful thing. It was that basically they were just living um, on, by the flesh, right? So Jude 1 and 4 says, this is another um, uh, 
version. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's important to kind of know what, what, what we're really talking about here is apostasy, right? And so the, the person that you're talking to, you know, as we always say, again, we are, we are here learning tonight about just this warning, right? About this warning. Um, somebody's firing a shot over your bow, as they say in the Navy, you know, um, trying to tell you, hey, get your attention. They're trying to get your attention. Pay attention, pay attention. And so here is Jude. And these men are ungodly men turning the grace of God into that seed. So they, they, they were taking this liberty that God's grace allowed them to live any kind of way that they wanted. And we see it all the time, right? And it's just another translation here. So in Romans 8 and 13, according, it says, living according to the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you live through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are God. So in Romans 6, I, I was reading that last night, you know, and I always, when I read that, I always think, you know, remind myself to always use my body to glorify God, you know. If you don't, you know, we, we always do crazy stuff, you know, but for the most part, I think that men of Christ, they use their bodies to glorify God, you know, they, as best as they can. You know, they, they'll fall short. They're going to they're gonna fall down. The Bible says you're going to fall down, so you can you, you forget saying that you don't. But you, for the most part, using your body to glorify God. You know, and so these men or these believers or unbelievers, these libertines, they use their bodies to please themselves. And so that's what that is. They're taking liberty with God's grace that they can live any kind of way they want. So this spirit, we see, we know that in Genesis 2 and 7, we see that God breathed this spirit into us, right? And so we know that we are spirit men, or spirit people, and we also have a soul. Um, and a word for that in the, uh, the apologetic study Bible would be the, I'm not sure how that's pronounced, though, nephish, nephish, what's it, nephish, so it's spirit. A conscious person without a flesh and bone that parts to God upon their death. And I was talking to Pastor Nick last Sunday. I was like, man, you know, I was like reading this, man. I'm thinking, all this stuff, man, you know, it's like, you know, comes out of this, out of these 25 passages, man. You know, who would have thought that y'all could get so much out of just 25 passages? But it's a reminder um, to me, really, because, you know, we all struggle. You know, we all struggle uh, um, with liberty. Uh, and so it's important to remember that um, I have another scripture up here that in the Ruah, of course, is infusing something that animates and then gives it life and a conscience. That's your soul. So we have this. So in Acts 6, right? So here's Stephen. But one day, some man from the synagogue of freed slaves, he's talking about these same libertines, as it is called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, we'll talk about that in a second, Sicilia, and the province of Asia. And so this Alexander, Alexandria, um, this guy was called um, Arius. Um, he studied in Antioch. And so Arius had this philosophy where he um, would actually, give me one second. Um, he argued with the, uh, let's see, Arius, a Christian priest from Alexandria, Egypt, was trained at Antioch in the early fourth century. Arius argued against and accused the church of practicing this Sabellian, Sabellianism, which is a false teaching which asserted that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were merely roles or modes assumed by God at various times, right? 
But check this out. So, so Arius was determined to emphasize about the oneness of God, but went too far in describing God's nature by denying the Trinity, by making a difference between the Father and the Son. Well, how did he do that? So Arius described Jesus as harmon, E-O-U-S-I-O-N, right? Homoousius, right? So he included this one letter which changed the whole meaning of the word. And in changing the meaning of that word, he denied that Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit and God are, are the same essence. And so when, in my point of view, when Jude is talking about these apostasies, he's really pointing out to be aware in the details of what's being talked about. Because just like this guy Arius had this dream, this idea about changing people's minds, he was using this one letter that would just throw off the whole conversation and you would just agree and you would follow along. So they caught on to this guy, right? And so then the Council of Nicaea, I believe it was in AD 325, um, gathered together and looked at this, looked at this uh, explanation that he had, the Father existed before the Son. There was a time when the Son did not exist. Therefore, the Son was created by the Father. And therefore, although the Son was the highest of a creature, he was not the essence of God. That's what he was arguing about. And so again, the Council of Nicaea got together and said, oh, oh time out, time out, time out. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. And so they excommunicated this guy, right? So what do you have nowadays? Here it is. This is A.D. 325, right? And I was talking to Harry today. You know, you have cults who now believe this same philosophy. This is 2017. You know, they, they banned it or they, they said it was wrong, but still there are people out there that believe it. And if you're unaware of this, of this doctrine, you know, then you, you know, you, I think we hear it a lot here. We hear uh, people say, you know, if, um, yeah, I believe in Jesus, you know, what do you believe about him? That, that's a good question to always ask. What do you, what do you believe about him? I'm always um, a little uh, hesitant to really even, when I hear somebody say, yeah, I'm, 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 I believe in Jesus, you know. Uh, it was a lady at my church, not at my church, but at work who's, um, uh, from Serbia, and um, I don't know how one day we got to talking, man, and um, she says, yeah, I, I go to, I go to uh, Orthodox Church, and she got to describing the priests and these beads and Jesus, you know, and it sounded strange to me, you know, but I didn't, I, 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 I said, okay, okay, you know, um, she said, yeah, I go to the priest, and then the priest prays for me, and then, you know, we believe in Jesus. I said, well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm confused. I'm confused. You know, I said, so you got to go to the priest, and the priest pray for you, and you believe in Jesus. Are you a Christian or are you Catholic? No, I'm not Catholic. I'm Christian. I said, okay. I said, I don't know. I said, I saw one thing on 60 Minutes about the, I'm not, I'm not real studious on this, but um, the Orthodox Church. Um, what was it? Somewhere in the Middle East, they were the old Christian Orthodox Church. Um, and they, pra they had a lot of these uh, crosses they walked around with, and they had uh, the black turbans and, and black stuff on, you know. So I didn't really understand exactly what they believed. I just kind of was watching, you know, TV. So it sounded like that's kind of what she was alluding to, but I'm, I'm not really sure. But anyway, the point being, it didn't sound right to me. So I was kind of like, well, I don't know if I, I don't need to go to no priest. I just go pray, you know. You know, I don't need somebody. Well, if the priest pray for you, then I said, nah. I mean, you know, okay, you know, whatever. I kind of left it alone at that. So. so we have another chapter. So 2 John 7 and 10. So for, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ 
is come in the flesh, right? This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Whoever does not abide in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Aided in Christ hath not the Father and the Son. If any bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. Neither bid him God speed. God be with you. That's what I wrote in there. You are, if you do, you are a partaker in this sort of doctrine, right? That's kind of hard. I mean, I have parents who are unbelievers. They mean well, you know. Um, and I, I, I have to catch myself time when I say, um, God be with you, you know, God bless you, you know. I want, I want them to do well. I really do. I want them to do well. But I don't want to encourage them also in what they're doing. It's kind of a thin line, you know, between love and discipline, you know, um, because um, you kind of, I mean, I've, I've learned a long time ago, man, the hard way that you can't really make them inroads, man, if you're always battling, you know, you can't, you kind of have to, you know, I'm praying for you, you know, um, you know, and sometimes, you know, by, the, by them being my parents, you know, here we are talking about this unawares thing. I remember when I first came to North Carolina, I wasn't a believer, right? And my wife and I weren't going to church, and we had just bought a home, and um, it was a Hurricane Katrina had happened, and my parents moved up here from Louisiana, right? And so they were living with me in my house. You know, I wasn't a believer. I mean, I knew they were going to the Kingdom Hall. Matter of fact, um, I was playing golf with a guy. He was a Jehovah's Witness, and he told me that. And I told him, yeah, my parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. They're going to be moving up here. He said, well, when they come, have them call me. If I had known that they were non-believers then, I would never introduce them to that guy. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? So by being an unbeliever, I basically put my parents in harm's way. You know, I could, if I had been following Christ at that time, I could have kind of maybe stirred them away. I don't know. Maybe, you know, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. You know, that, that kind of freaks me out sometimes, you know, but, you know, so where was I going with that? But that's kind of where I was at. But uh, I'm just saying, man, you know, that, so the point being that they was in my house and we were sitting down. I mean, you may not be heard those before. They were in my house, man, and they asked me to do, do a Bible study with them, right? And uh, so we sat down at the table, man, and uh, so I had my Bible, you know, and they had their Bible, and they said, well, you can't read from that one. You got to read from this one. I said, why? What's, what's the difference? You know, I mean, you know, I, What's the difference between this one and that one? It's the word of God is the word of God. I, had, I mean, I knew that much, I guess, you know. I, it's the word of God, the word of God. No, that, that's, that's a different interpretation. But God protected me, and he says, you don't want to read that. Don't read that. So I didn't read it, and here we are today at the bridge, right? Praise the Lord. All right. So moving on. So... Keeping with the study, there was, and what I'm saying here is that, and this is, and I, I'm kind of, this is what I learned through my study. Mine's a little bit different than a lot of people, is that, you know, uh, just to bring these things home to me. Uh, in 2010, there was a study done by a prominent atheist uh, named Daniel Dennett and uh, Linda Lascola called The Preachers Who Are Not Believers. And so this work that they did chronicles five different preachers who over time were presented with an accepted heretical teaching about Christianity and now have completely fallen away from their faith and are either, uh, either pantheists or clandestine atheists. One of the most disturbing truths highlighted in this study is that these preachers maintain their position as pastors of, of Christian churches with their congregations being unaware of their leader's true spiritual state. You can read it for yourself. I got that off of gotquestions.org. Yeah, trip me out, man. So for me, man, you know, this whole study, I mean, there's a lot packed in here. But 
to me, it's this apostasy. You know, we hear about it, but what is it? You know, what, what is it? What is this apostasy, man? And how in the world does it get into the church unawares? You know, I mean, let's, let's be honest, man. I've talked to people that go to church here now who were preaching and were unbelievers while they were preaching. Yeah, but they're believers now. I mean, so I don't think they were trying to, you know, um, twist the word around or anything like that, but they were having doubts within themselves, and they were just kind of like, hey, man, I don't know about all this stuff, you know, but yet they were still teaching the gospel, you know? So, and that's not... Um, throwing kind of any, any, any sort of shade or anything like that. It's just a reality. You know what I'm saying? It's just a reality. It's just a reality. It's just a reality, man. You know, um, it's always, <laughs> it's always best, I'll speak from my own perspective, it's always best to pay attention. It's always best to pay attention. Um, you know, it's always best to pay attention. You just pay attention. And so, so anyway, Jude writes what? For what? He tells us to what? To contend for the faith. He says to agonize, to fight for the faith in this book. So, man, this is what we're doing. This is, that's, if you don't know why you're here, tonight is your night. You're here tonight to know that you need to fight for the gospel. You need to fight for your family. You need to fight for your friends, your neighbors. Because, you know, man, if you, can, if you read this book, this book will lead you to a lot of things. It will lead you to study about hell, shield, Hades, any dark place torment, <laughs> tormenting, because, you know, it tells you that there is a place for these people. It tells you right here in the book of Jude, there is a place for these people. What is that place? If you're looking at it, you're going to ask yourself, what is that place? What is that place? When you go to the book of Luke 16, my favorite Book of Luke 16, I think it's 22 and 23, if I'm not mistaken, where the rich man and the poor man die. And the Bible says, what does it say? It says that the poor man goes to be in the bosom of Abraham. And then it distinctly says the rich man is buried. He is buried torment. So as we talked about it earlier, man, this soul that we all have, you know, it's, it's awake in the grave, man. It's not soul sleep like the Jehovah's Witnesses say, but they're conscious that this is happening, right? You heard it from the platform. This is, this is really happening, man. The Bible describes it in this, you know, Luke, man. And it, it, it always, it always amazes me, man, if that's the word I've been looking for, that, you know, you know, here we are as human beings, this, this soul and this spirit, man, and you, we think that once it's over, it's just over, you know? No, that's not what the Bible said. They, they, they go somewhere. They, they, they just don't disappear, you know, like in the grave. And they, you know, they, they go, it goes to a place. There's a place for it, you know? So, when, you, when you're talking about, when you're talking to other people, man, you know, keep that in mind, you know, when you, you know, trying to share the gospel with them, man, you know, um, you don't have to really mention it, but just kind of, you know, for me, it's like, you know, dude, you, you know what you're asking for, you know. So we have a quote here from A.W. Tozer. It says, so skilled is error at imitating the truth that the two are constantly being mistaken for each other. It takes a sharp eye these days to know which brother is Cain and which is Abel. A sharp eye to know 
which one is which. Unawares, creep right in. Huh? But you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention. Um, where's my own? I want to show y'all something real quick, man. That's the parable right there. Okay, listen. So, in Thessalonians, I think this is in Second Peter. I didn't. I don't have my thing. Second Peter um, talks about um, that these things you will, if, if you have these characteristics in your life, and you will have a productive and fruitful life. Right. This is what we want as godly men. This, these are the characters. So we want virtue. Right. We want the knowledge of God, which is most important. Self-control, right? We want to persevere. We want godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. If you have these characteristics, your life will be productive and future and, and fruitful. It's pretty simple. You know, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of us probably already have these things anyway, right? I mean, if you're, if, you're, if you're living for God and the Holy Spirit is in you, these are the things that you want to do anyway. You want to be productive. You want to be fruitful. You want your life to mean something. What did I read earlier? It says, it says that, another scripture, <clears throat> let's see if I can find that one. It talks about um, what did you do when you were living in the flesh that produced any sort of fruit? Was that in Second Peter? I, 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 can't, I think I thought I had it written down. But it asked, the question, it asked that question. What did you do when you were living for yourself that produced any sort of fruit? A lot of us, man, we go around thinking, you know, about all the crazy things we did and wish that we had never done it. I mean, I've never heard anybody say, man, I've done some crazy crap, man, but you know, I'm so glad I did it. Not me, not me. I mean, the experience and everything, but no, man, because it, it didn't produce any fruit. You know, you, you ended up hurting somebody or you ended up hurting yourself or disrespecting somebody or whatever the case may be. No fruit came of it. Nothing. Nothing came of that, man. You know, but all these guys running around with kids out of wedlock. I mean, that's the first thing that comes to my mind, you know. Whatever, you know. What fruit is that, man? You got a, a child out here that doesn't have a father. You know, I mean, you know, millions of people, man. You know, not to say anything bad about them. You know, just that, you know, as the Bible scribes it, it's unfruitful. You got a bunch of kids, but hey, your kids need a father. You know, they need you to be there. And you're, they say, well, you know, I'm there for my kids, you know. I take care of my kids. I send the money, I send all my money to my kids, you know. Yeah, but anyway, that's my thing. All right. So time is 10 minutes to 8. So the bottom line, gentlemen, all right. So again, it says, talking about the last part, we're not on time here. I want to go back to, so again, remember that um, when you live your life in this fashion, Right. The Bible says that God will give you over to this delusion. Right. He will allow you to live your life that way. If that's what you want to do with your life, the Bible says that God will allow you. He will give you over to this delusion. Let's see. Where's it at? You read that in Romans. Is that one in 26 or 1 and 24? Let me double check. Excuse me for being a little uncontrollable here. Yeah. 
So he would use every, so this is talking about the enemy. He would use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. And God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. It's true, man. I mean, you, you have scripture that says that uh, God will use, uh, um, I mean, Pharaoh is a good example, right? He used Pharaoh. Pharaoh believed whatever, whatever he believed. And so the Holy God just said, hey, okay, well, that's what you want to believe. He hardened his heart, and that's what he did. So he, he, delusional. Delusional is, is not true. All right. All right. So, again, how do, you, how do you recognize them? Number one is that they're going to be, the, the great apostasy is what? What is the great apostasy, man? Number one is the falling away from the truth, denying that Christ is, is the Messiah. That's the falling away from the truth. And how do you know that, the, that uh, the other part of the apostasy is that when people say that Christ has already come, that's the second part. He's already here. He's already come. Those are the two main things. Christ is, Jesus is not Lord, he's not the Messiah, and that he has already come. Those are the two main apostasies that you'll hear. And so, in Thessalonians it talks about that the great falling away won't happen until Satan has already shown himself in the temple in Jerusalem, right? Everybody's good. All right, so it's important that you know what the great, what the falling away is. That's the apostasy. This is what Jew is trying to tell us about. So we know that those things have not happened. But as we get closer to the end times, more people will begin to fall away. They will begin to fall away from the faith. That's scriptural. You can count on it. Don't be one of those. And then so Jude says in 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to resent you faultless before the presence of his fallen glory with exceeding joy. So God is able to keep us from falling. You know? If I'm continually to study in my word and I'm not living for my flesh, and I'm aware, and I'm paying attention. I got my eyes open, and I'm living for the Lord. I'm being productive, I'm being fruitful. Then God is able to keep me from the unfallen, to not fall, not to fall into the trap. You know, I, the, I, <laughs> I was read, reading this information. It says, you know, Satan didn't come in with a great boom to deceive Eve and Adam. He came with a dream. Right? It's a, it, was, it, was just, it was just an idea or an idea. He came, he came and deceived them with an idea. Like this Arius guy, it's an idea. It wasn't scriptural. It was an idea. And so... What I, I had to ask myself the question, what did, so were Adam and Eve already headed toward destruction? Because the Bible says, you know, these people are already headed toward destruction in this Jews, right? He said they were from old. They were already headed that way. Were Adam and Eve headed that way? I mean, I heard some people say, you know, God already had a plan. He had a plan in place for redemption of mankind already. So, I mean... I'm just asking the question, you guys, you allow me a little latitude here. You know, were Adam and Eve already headed toward destruction? They were in paradise. And they allowed themselves to be caught up in a dream or an idea. Much like, much like today, right? I was listening to a radio station coming in. Uh, this girl, this uh, guy, um, Armstrong Williams, I don't know if you guys heard him, but he's a Republican black guy. And uh, he um, had this young lady on there, and she was talking about millennials 
And um, she said, millennials are always um, so caught up in uh, social issues and not really paying attention to the big picture. You know, I said, mm, that's interesting. You know, the reason why I listen to the guy because he, every now and then he always has these people calling in and they quote scripture and he talks about Jesus as his Lord and Savior, you know, that kind of thing, you know. Then, 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 then sometimes he talks about evolution. I'm thinking, okay, wait a minute, what is this, you know? But it, sometimes there's some good stuff on there. But the idea being, you know, we get so caught up in these ideas, you know, not really paying attention to what's really going on, you know. And the church, my friends, is a place that we need to be paying attention. Because, you know, there are a lot of social issues going on, right? Everybody agree? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you even turn on the radio, I mean, you just look at the newspaper, if you just, I mean, if you watch NFL, you know, or the NBA or anything like that, you know, I mean, the social issues are crazy right about now, man, right? And all of this, uh, all this stuff, man, but I'm gonna end on this note. You know, man, I've been doing a lot of soul searching lately. And because I've been looking for a reason to be angry, you know? Um, because of all these social issues, right? Um, but you know what? As I was reading the book of Jude and reading about prayer, there is nowhere in the scripture that gives you the right to be angry about social issues, about inequality, about mistreatment. The list goes on and on. I mean, I can stand up here and tell you how I was treated as a child or whatever, where I come from and all that. But the Bible doesn't give me a reason to go out and find vengeance or to find hate against anybody. It doesn't, I look for it, trust me. In the last six months, I've been trying to find it. Give me a reason to just to find something to talk about. I want to, man, I want to raise a flag, man. I want to just put it on the ground. Well, we got something to talk about now. It ain't there. It's not there. So what are you, what are you, what are you going to do with that, you know? What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with all that pent-up anxiety and energy that you have? You're so angry, you know, about what's going on in the world, you know? What are you going to do about that? You're going to wait for the government to turn around, and maybe pass a law that's going to make everybody equal, get everybody equal pay, and da 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 this, that, and the other. That ain't in here either. It don't say the government going to do that. But what it does say, what it does say is that what? Brotherly kindness and love trumps the day. We ain't got, it's not a corporate thing, man. It's an individual thing. It's an individual thing. You know, when you talk about people creeping in unawares, it's an individual thing. You got to be paying attention. When somebody comes in or starts talking about hate and this, that, and the other, you got to be paying attention. You got to nip that in the bud from the jump. You can, that's the only way it's going to change. That's the only way we're going to save the church, man. God is a, is, has ordained us on the front line to protect the gospel. I don't even know if that's a crusade, man, but I'm telling you, we got this big red cross on our chest with, these, with our armor on, man. And that's what we're here for, man, whether you like it or not. If you're following Jesus, man, you in the army of God, brother. It's what it is. It is what it is, man. You can, I can try to 
shuck and jive all I want. I like I ain't here. But the bottom line is, man, the enemy is at my doorstep, and he's trying to get in. He's he trying to take my parents, trying to take my brothers, my sisters, my nieces, my nephews, my uncles, all of them, even some of my friends. What am I going to do about it? That's the question. What are you going to do about it? It's not whether or not God's going to do something. He's already did something. He died on the cross. The blood has already been shed. Now he's asking us, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to share that gospel in spite of all the enemies, in spite of all the difficulties that are facing you? Or are you just going to let them come on in and take over? Unaware. You're going to turn a blind eye. They ain't really here, man. No, they're standing right there. They stand. Hey, are you him? Yeah, I'm him. No, he ain't going to tell you that. He's he's standing right there. Be aware, man, especially if you're in leadership, you know what I mean? If you got new guys that come in the door, man, you know, man, pull up next to them, man. Find out where they at, you know? That's how we sit on the street, you know? Pull up next to them, man. Find out where they at, you know? I mean, you know, get to know them, you know? I mean, what's happening, man? How you doing? Where you at? Where you, where you from? You know? Fill them out, man, you know? What are you, what you here for? Come on in. You want some coffee? Love to see you. Come back next week. I had a guy who I was in a cafe. I said I was going to end on this dinner, so I was going to end before dinner. I'm going to end right now. This guy, after Sunday school, I was back there having a cup of coffee. For whatever reason, I don't know. Never have coffee after church. But I had a cup of coffee that day. And I sat down in that chair out there. And a guy walked in the back door. Black guy. Two little girls. I said, hmm. You never seen him before. He said, I'm here to see Pastor Neil. I'm sitting there. He was talking to the lady at the bar back there. She was like, well, I don't know where he at. I said, well, to myself, James, you an elder, stand up and, t- and introduce yourself to the guy. I mean, come on, man, what, what are you doing, what are you doing? I said, ah, I'm trying to read right now, you know. So I gets up, you know, I say, hey, man, what's going on, man? He said, I'm here to see Pastor Neil, man. I said, okay, let me try to text him. Pastor Neil was in a meeting, so he gave me his name, da, 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 you know. He says, hey, man, he said, I see you on the front line. You down in here in this church, man. I said, what? I said, what? Damn, you on the front line, man, down here on this church, man. I said, you're a true soldier. I said, well, I, I, okay, you know, true soldier. I said, so, uh, what's going on with you? He said, well, man, he said, I came to this church uh, with Pastor Neil, man. He said, you know, um, I'm from down at the Cherry Street Jail. Um, I've been in prison. And um, he said, man, when I came here, man, they treated me kind of crazy, man. They, they, they like they didn't want to be around me or something, man. You know, I said, for real? He said, yeah, man. He said, they treat me bad, man. He said, well, Pastor Neil, he's all right, man. I like Pastor Neil. You know, I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that. And like I was telling Steve one before, I said, you know, sometimes you got to be careful with that, you know, that kind of dialogue, man, because that can kind of turn around a little bit, you know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so I mean, the guy seemed like he was genuine, and it kind of bothered me because I thought to myself, that's not the church that I go to. That's not the church that I've been going to for the last 12 years. I may have wanted to see that, but I've never seen that here at the bridge. And so for somebody to tell me that that's what they experienced when they came in the door the first time, I'm a little thrown back. Like, wow. For real? That's your first impression? You've been here one time? That's your first impression? That's important. That's important to know, you know, that somebody came here and didn't feel welcome. Not because I don't think nobody tried to make you feel welcome. I think people around here try to make you feel welcome. But then again, there's some people that they, they become a little standoffish too, you know? So the point being, man, 
brotherly kindness and love for everybody. It doesn't matter who it is. That's the only way the world gonna change. That's the only way people gonna, people gonna have a different point of view about church, about any church. Why can't I go down the street to any church? Why? Why is that? Hmm? Tell me. You know what? I'll tell you like this. I can invite a black guy to church and he won't come. I can invite a white guy to church. You know what he'd tell me? You, you go to black church? What kind of church you, you, you go to? I probably ain't welcome there. <laughs> Why? What, what difference does it make? I mean, I invite you to church, man. What's the problem, you know? That's what I'm saying, man. So, you know, we got to change that, man. You know, we got to change that. We got to change that perception. You know, this, this whole thing, man, is just, it's, 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 out of, it's out of control, man. It's out of control. You know, you should be, you should feel welcome to go to any church you want to go to. As long as you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, that door should be open. You know, there shouldn't be no, be no restrictions about who comes in that door. You know, there should be no restrictions on how you treat somebody based upon what they look like. You know, tattoos, long hair, whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, pants dragged into the ground. I don't really like that, but I mean, you know, still, you know. Hey, if he's coming to search for the Lord, man, open the door. Let the brother in. Let the sister in. You know. You never know, like you said, he could be the next pastor. He could be the next elder, the next deacon, you know. He, he could be the next man to catch you walking down the highway when your car broke down to give you a ride, you know. A good brother, a good sister, man, you know, so. All right, man, so I think I'm off. Lord, thank you so much for this evening. I know I kind of drifted away, but I pray that, hmm. Uh, what we shared, God, was helpful in some kind of way. It was helpful to me. And so I thank you for the book of Jude to allow me to just delve into your love, Father, and let you let me know that I have to live my life for you. And all of my members, as your word says. And so I ask you, you would just continue to bless these men tonight, Father, as they go about their way, about their families. And God, just... Fill them with your love, God. Um, fill them with your Holy Spirit. Um, give them the power to just, um, you know, love everybody that they meet. Give everybody a chance, you know, but also be discerning. Give them the minds and the tools, God, to be discerners of apostasy. Knowing that your, what your word tells us that it looks like. Whenever someone comes to us with some sort of some sort of idea about who you are that's not biblically based, give us the knowledge and the wisdom to discern the untruth. We need that. We, we need that. We need that desperately, God. And give us the wisdom to be able to share the gospel according to your word, Father in truth and in sincerity. We're not, so that we're not being sought out as somebody that's grubbling for money. We're here to share you. And that's it. That's all we can do. You know, he says our heart is deceitfully wicked, but God, we ask that you would just step into that place, be our mediator, you know, as our spirits groan to find a way to communicate with those that we talk to or when we pray for them, praying for the lost, praying for each other. God, help us to remove all those barriers that may hinder those sorts of relationships, God. Mm. I'll lift up to you, Pastor David and his family and the rest of the folks that go to church here, God, whatever they're going through, cancers and families lost and 
We ask you to just send someone, God, to just share your gospel, you know, it doesn't matter who it is. Mm. Give us the strength to do that, Father. Mm -mm. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say, Amen.